Thank you very much. Wow. That many people, huh? Amazing. Thank you all so much for welcoming me, welcoming me here. I am very, very excited to be back in Portugal. This is my third time traveling this beautiful, amazing country. And every single time I come back, it's an absolute blast. The people here are always very generous and welcoming. So thank you for being here and giving me your hopefully undivided attention. Most of you have probably heard recently about the Amazon rainforest burning, right? Or Australia being on fire. Some of you may have even heard about Indonesia, Alaska, Siberia. All of those cool places are on fire, right? Beautiful places. Now, there are a couple of things that we do as humans, of course, that contribute to this problem. But there is one very specific thing that we do that is far more deadly and dangerous than all the other things that we do. Now, what comes to your mind when you hear this? What do you think it might be? Maybe all the pesticides that we're spraying across all the plants, right? Not really. Maybe it's all the plastic pollution, all the plastic straws in the oceans that everybody keeps talking about. It is a problem, but still, not really. Well, then it must be the fossil fuels, right? Burning all the fossil fuels for electricity and transportation, all the planes flying all over the place. Well, it is a serious issue, of course, and we have to address it as well. But it's still not the number one contributor to climate change. So what is this mysterious thing that no one really talks about, yet it makes up for up to 51% of all greenhouse gas emissions in our atmosphere? I'm going to get into it a little bit later on in the presentation. First, I'm going to share a couple of stories and say a couple of words about myself so that you have a general idea of why I'm even here and why the hell I'm telling you all this stuff. Now, keep in mind, apparently this curtain right here is, is torn off, it's broken, so You'll probably not be able to see this very well, but we have a computer here, a smaller version of the presentation, so hopefully it's going to help you a little bit to have an idea of what's going on on the slides, and I hope you can see it well enough. So a little bit about myself. My name is Radim. I come from the Czech Republic, and before I started traveling the world as a full-time activist, I worked in an IT company, and before that I worked for this insurance company. I was wearing a tuxedo and a tie and making a lot of money, and I really cared about my social status, right, and all, this, uh, all these material things, like most people do. But one day, I came back to work, and I sat in front of my computer. It was a day just like any other, but all of a sudden, this feeling hit me. This feeling like I had to leave, I had to quit, and I had to do more for the animals and the planet because the crisis is getting worse and the animals are dying and so on and so on. So long story short, shortly after that, I quit my job and I started traveling the world, uh, doing talks, workshops for activists, investigations, and basically from uh, working in this company, I went to illegally occupying farms, entering farms in order to investigate them, raise awareness about what's happening in them. Uh, sometimes I participate in civil disobedience, which is a type of direct activism that puts a lot of pressure on companies or directly the government. And like I said, I do this full time. Now, I have been arrested in three different countries for trying to help animals and trying to raise awareness about the climate crisis. Now, I want you to keep in mind that I have never in my life hurt anyone. I have never broken anything, not even attempted to. This is not what I'm about. This is not my intention, all right? So now you might, now you might be wondering, why the hell is this so important to me? Why would he go out of his way to actually risk his freedom in order to save some chickens. Well, I'm going to tell you in a little bit, and I'm also hoping that today I'm going to change the way you think about your daily lives. So this is my mom, not the one in the middle, all right? <laughs> the one in the middle, that's Bobo. Now, Bobo is a little piglet, was liberated by animal rights activists such as myself from a place of torture, from a place with very poor, horrible conditions, and he came to us with a lot of inflammation, a lot of disease. Uh, sometimes what the farmers do in pig farms is they cut off the tails of the little piglets for various reasons, and Bobo, he was actually missing a piece of his butt, so a piece of his body part. So it was really, you know, swollen, it was a lot of inflammation, and his limbs were broken, so he couldn't really walk properly. He required a lot of medical attention, right? Now, he came to us from a place like this. Now, what you see on the picture is a farrowing crate. Now, what a farrowing crate is, is this type of cage that's just a little bit bigger than the actual body of the mother pig, or the sow, what the industry calls them, S-O-W. And this is where the mother is kept from this point uh, before giving birth to her babies until a couple weeks later, 
until the babies don't require the milk of the mother anymore. And then the babies are taken away from her. After that, she's put back into a gestation crate. Now, just like the farrowing crate, it's just a little bit bigger than the actual body of the mother pig. And this is where they are kept during pregnancy. So after the babies are taken away from her, she will be artificially inseminated, forced to give birth to more babies, and she's put back into a gestation crate. This photo was taken by, uh, by us in front of a slaughterhouse. So what you're seeing on the picture, there's this tiny uh, thing that's actually a metal cage of a transportation truck. And uh, the male pigs of the industry, they get sent to a slaughterhouse at the age of just six months old. Now, why so young? Well, because when they're just six months old, they already reach the required size for slaughter. They don't really grow much more after that. So it's okay, we can already kill them, right? So this photo was taken by us in front of a slaughterhouse in a transportation truck. And I don't want any answers, you don't have to answer out loud or anything, but I want you to think for a second just to yourself, quietly, what do you think this pig might be feeling in that moment, if you look in his eyes? If we can agree on the fact that pigs can feel, of course, what do you think this pig might be feeling? So sometimes what we do is these, we call it slaughterhouse vigil, which basically means we go in front of a slaughterhouse, we kindly ask the drivers of the transportation trucks to stop for a few minutes so that we could take a couple photos, videos, share it on social media so that people could connect. We encourage people who maybe consume animal products such as meat, milk, eggs, and so on to come with us and to connect with the animals and see them for themselves. One of the main reasons we do this is because how often do we actually get to see these animals? Put your hand up if you've ever seen a pig on a way to a slaughterhouse in a transportation truck. All right. All right, some people, less than a half, not all of us, right? And that's because these places are so well hidden from the eye of the public, because if we saw them, if we saw what's going on, we would probably think about it differently. So this photo was taken after, uh, about an hour after the previous photos, and uh, they had this window that they keep, kept shutting down because they didn't want us to take the photos, but of course, it smells horribly inside because of all the slaughter, so they, keep, they have to keep opening the windows, otherwise they suffocate. So they did, and we managed to take a couple of these photos of the hanging bodies of the pigs. And now I want you to make uh, the connection. Try to think about the connection between what you answer to yourself with the previous picture and what's happening on this photo right here. Now, this particular picture, I couldn't really get, I don't know if you can see it properly, I couldn't really get a high-resolution photo of this because it's so hard for activists to get into these places. Unless you go undercover, you get a job there, you have a hidden camera, you kill animals, and then they don't question you. It's really hard. So what you're seeing on this picture is actually a gas chamber. Put your hand up if you knew that they had gas chambers in slaughterhouses. Not a single person. <laughs> have you ever heard the term gas chamber before? Right? So in this particular pig slaughterhouse, it was just about 30 minutes away from where I used to live, they had gas chambers, just like many other slaughterhouses all over the world. So what happens there is they load the pigs onto this cage, then they lower the cage into the gas chamber, they pump CO2 gas inside in order to stun the pigs so that they become unconscious. Now, first of all, that doesn't necessarily always happen. Sometimes they don't get stunned. It just burns their lungs and they go through a lot of suffering. But if they do end up getting stunned, they hang them upside down and they slit their throats. And just because they were unconscious during the process of slitting their throats, they call it humane slaughter. Now, I will leave this up to you, but to me personally, the words humane and, sl and, and slaughter in one sentence, it just doesn't sit with me. It just doesn't sit with me. Unless the sentence is something like, there is no humane way to slaughter an animal. So Bobo, he got lucky. He didn't have to go, go through any of this. And this is a more recent photo of him, where he's about five to six months old. And uh, I didn't mention my mom, she runs an animal sanctuary for, for such animals back in the Czech Republic. So she takes care of them now. And uh, this is just a photo of him hanging out with his best friend, Nella, a little puppy. And they're just playing in the snow. And I think this photo is very powerful because we are so disconnected from these types of animals, right? Scientists have actually concluded that pigs are six times more intelligent than dogs. Why don't we care about them so much as we do about dogs? 
This photo I took personally the first time I went to a dairy farm, a milk farm. So as I was approaching this farm, already from the distance, about 500 meters away, I could already smell this horrible stench of death. It was burning my lungs, I could barely breathe. And there were houses of people living there, right next to the farm. And of course, workers at the farm, working there. And I was thinking to myself, how are they able to do this? This is insane. And when I got closer, it was worse and worse and it kept in intensifying. And then I finally entered the actual property of the farm and the first thing I see right there in front of me, dead bodies, a body of a dead cow. And I'm like, what the hell? So I managed to talk to one of the workers of that milk farm and I asked, what happened with that cow down there? Why is she just like lying there dead with no attention given to her? And she said, oh, well, she dropped dead because her, she was too old and her heart just gave up. She was exhausted. And I said, okay, how old was she? And she said, seven years old. And I thought to myself, that doesn't sit with me because cows naturally can live up to 20 or 25 years old even when they're in nature. What does she mean by saying she's too old when she's just seven years old? So later on I found out that in the dairy industry, the cows get artificially inseminated, which basically means that the farmers would use this robotic machine or they take a big plastic glove and they stick it in the cow's vagina. Of course, no one's asking her if that's okay. Why do they do this? Well, because she's able to give birth to a baby calf. And once that happens, she's able to produce milk and we want the milk. Now, after the birth of the baby calf, depending on the gender, so if it's a boy, they will send them off to a slaughterhouse right away. Maybe a couple, after a couple of days or weeks. Because for the industry, they're useless. They don't produce milk. So they send them off to a slaughterhouse, kill them off for veal meat. Now with the females, they repeat the same process. They will, nine months of pregnancy, just like a human mother, gives birth to the baby calf. We asked one of the farmers, how long does the baby get to stay with their mother? He said, 30 minutes. 30 minutes is all they ever get together. So this is what it looks like in the milk production, during the milk production. The mother cows, they get hooked onto these tubes and of course they keep sucking the milk out of their udders. It's very exhausting. And they're locked inside of these like cages where I don't know what they call them. They just like can't really move around. They can't escape or anything. And they're trying, really trying. I've seen it firsthand so many times. And this is where the babies are taken afterwards. So they will keep them in, the, in these uh, small cages, never to see their mother again. I don't know how it works here, but back in my country, the ear tags, the pink ones are for boys, so you know that they're gonna be sent off to a slaughterhouse very soon, and the yellow ones are for girls. So the first time I went to this dairy farm, I made a very strong connection with a, a particular baby calf, and I knew he was a boy because of the tag, and I knew he was gonna be slaughtered in a couple days, so I got this tattoo right here to remember him with this number, because we made such a strong bond. Again, a cow in a transportation truck on the way to a slaughterhouse. I think the eyes are always very powerful. They tell us a lot, right? So again, try to think what might this cow might be, might this cow be feeling in that moment? And this is a photo of me cuddling, a, not a cow, but actually a bull, so a male cow. Now we always have this idea about bulls being so aggressive and angry all the time, right? Well, if you're not waving a red flag in front of their faces, this is about as aggressive as they get, all right? They're just like puppies. Another story of an individual that was saved by activists. This is Kira. Uh, Kira, we managed to save her during an action in Italy where we occupied a farm and we wanted to negotiate the possibility of the farmer giving us a few lives. It was right before Christmas, so we were hoping for an act of kindness. And it happened. He gave us three hens. So Kira, Laura, and Siobhan, right? So we managed to save the three of them. And she came to us from a place like this. Now, I don't know if you can see it properly, uh, but basically what's happening on the picture is thousands and thousands of hens crampled up into this tiny, these tiny cages all together. And of course, that's, there's a lot of disease. Uh, they can attend to their natural basic needs. And this is actually not a poultry farm. It's not for meat production or anything. This is actually an egg laying facility. Now, why do I want to talk about the egg industry? Well, because it is very similar to the dairy industry. The male chicks get killed off at the age of just one day old because for the egg industry, they're useless. Once again, they don't produce eggs, so there's no need to keep them. And uh, 
when the hens actually lay eggs, it's basically they're a part of their menstrual cycle. And in nature, they would lay around 10 to 15 eggs a year. But they are so genetically modified that they are forced to, give, to lay up to 300 eggs a year. Ladies, imagine having your period 300 days a year. Very, very exhausting. So this is what happens with the male chicks. Right after they're born, one day old, they put them in these, uh, these crates, and right after that, still alive, fully conscious, they put them into this big blender, and they just blend it up, blend them up alive into chicken nuggets, and so on, and so on. So that's the egg industry. So what is actually contributing to this climate crisis that we're facing right now so much, and why the hell do I keep talking about chickens? Well, there are almost 8 billion of us right now on this planet, almost 8 billion people. And yet we somehow managed to kill around 75 billion land animals and literally trillions of marine animals, like fish for example, every single year, just for our consumption. So overpopulation along with the industrial revolution have created this fast mass production of virtually everything that we can buy today. And it seems that we never have enough. We always, always want more. So we're going to take a brief look at an overview of where we currently are with the climate, emer uh, climate emergency. I don't want to get too scientific on you. There's just a couple of statistics, a couple of numbers. I don't want to bore you to death. But uh, this is a graph that shows the warming of the planet. And we see that, of course, there's always been fluctuations. The heat has always been like going up and down, up and down, naturally. But for the past 200 years, it's just been rising rapidly. So that's basically from about the point where the Industrial Revolution happened. Right? And the planet is now actually warmer than at any point in the past 650,000 years. 650,000 years. Scientists have concluded that by the year 2023, we could potentially have no Arctic ice left whatsoever in the summer. It's very, very soon. It's not a lot of time. So the temperature is rising. The Arctic sea ice is melting, and as more and more ice melts, uh, the darker ocean water absorbs more and more heat, and of course, this results in even more temperature rising. And that just keeps running, running around in cycles and repeating itself, and we call this the albedo effect. So right now, in these areas where we live, it's already about a, a one degree Celsius rise, but in those places like the Arctic or Greenland, it's about two degrees already. Because of this effect, it's rising more and more rapidly than in Europe, for example. We have successfully inhalated with our human interference around 40% of all amphibians, 33% of all reef corals, 31% of all sharks and rays, around 25% of all mammals. Now it might be even more with everything that's been happening in Australia and so on and so on. 52% of the world's wildlife species disappeared in the past 40 years. More than half of them in just 40 years. All of this is caused by human interference. Some of it due to diseases, but most of those diseases could arguably be caused by humans as well. Hedgehogs, I used to have them all the time in front of my house back in Prague, Czech Republic. I used to uh, carry them from the road so that they wouldn't get run over by a car. Very cute animals. Now their numbers have dropped by 50% in the past 20 years. Half of them are gone in just 20 years. The willow titbird, 94% decline in 50 years. They're almost gone. There's an insect apocalypse. Now most of us are probably not big fans of insects. Right? They annoy us, they bite us, they don't look that cute. But they're actually very important to our ecosystems. And without them, we are pretty much doomed. So right now, we're heading for a 3 degree Celsius rise. Now, what happens when that happens? Because those are small numbers. It doesn't seem like much, right? But it's enough to throw things off balance. So we're looking at massive crop failure, more heat waves, more mass wildfires. Sea levels are going to keep rising. The land is going to be even drier. West Africa and the Middle East could be potentially completely uninhabitable. And we're looking at around 1 billion climate refugees in the next 30 years. So that's going to spark a lot of chaos in the society. And that all leads us to ecosystem collapse. 
The Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services concluded a study last year that said that our human interference altered or changed around 75% of all land-based environment, environment and 66% of the marine environment. And it also stated that over 33% of the world's land surface and nearly 75% of freshwater resources are now devoted to crop or livestock production. So that's agriculture. A lot of, a lot of agriculture, especially animal agriculture. One really good example of, ecos, uh, of uh, ecosystem collapse is bees. We probably realize, most of us realize, that bees are a very essential pollinator, very important part of, of our ecosystems. Very important. Now they are threatened with extinction. And without them, we're not going to have fruit trees like apples, uh, apricots, bananas, all sorts of berries, uh, even nuts like cashews, almonds, all those things, even coffee. Now most people I know can't even imagine their lives without coffee. Do you know anyone who wakes up in the morning and goes, oh, I need coffee, right? So now the coffee needs us. So where do all those greenhouse gases actually come from? There are a couple different studies on this, on how much animal agriculture actually contributes. As you can see, some of them state that animal agriculture is responsible for up to 14.5% of all greenhouse gas emissions in our atmosphere. Another study says it's around 18%. Some studies say it's up to 51%. Those are big differences, right? So which one of them is right? Well, it doesn't really matter all that much. Because even the lowest number is still much more than all transportation combined, which is just 13% of all greenhouse gas emissions. There was a Oxford University meta-study concluded by a guy called Joseph Poore. And what they did was basically they reviewed all of the scientific literature from I don't know how many years from history. They took a look at 119 countries all over the world, almost 40,000 different farms, and around 40 products representing the whole food product life cycle. Now what they concluded was that meat, aquaculture, eggs, and dairy use 83% of the world's farmland and contribute only 18% of our calories. They also concluded that without meat and dairy, global farmland use could be reduced by more than 76%, which is an area equivalent to the US, China, Australia, and the European Union combined and still feed the world. It also said a plant-based diet is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on the environment, not just greenhouse gases, but global acidification, land water use, and so on, and so on. The author of this study, Joseph Poor, he was consuming all of those animal products before, but because of what he discovered, he stopped. This graph shows how different food products impact the environment, so everything from everything that's above is animal products, as you can see, beef, lamb, farm prawns, cheese, all those things, fish. And the things that are a little bit more down there, beans, peas, nuts, tofu, all those things don't contribute that much. The last two ones, cow's milk and soy milk, look at the difference. Now why? Because we need a lot of land and water to grow these animals, like we've established before. Like we established before, they don't just appear out of nowhere. We create that life. We force them into existence. We keep forcibly impregnating them. We create that life and then we take it away from them. So imagine how much a cow or a pig would eat and drink, for example. It's much more than a human. 1,000 liters of water to produce one single beef burger. 1,000 liters of water. Absolutely insane. So this study found that transitioning to a completely plant-based society would release 3.1 billion hectares of land, which would be a 76 reduction. It would release 19% of arable land, which are all the crops used to, uh, for, for livestock to feed the animals. It would reduce acidification by 50%, water scarcity by 19%, and so on and so on. We could go on and on, the numbers are endless. Other impacts of animal agriculture. It uses 34 to 76 trillion gallons of water every single year. Way less than fracking, for example. Fracking is the process of drilling into the earth in order to get the oil out for energy and so on. 
It is the leading cause of species extinction, habitat destruction, ocean dead zones, and water pollution. It is a massive contributor to deforestation. Around 67% of all deforestation all over the world is because of animal agriculture. Around 91% of all deforestation in the Amazon rainforest and animal agriculture. And I'm going to talk about the Amazon in a little bit so that you have a little bit more details about what's actually happening there. If we take a look at the world 10,000 years ago, we can see that 99% of all the animals on this planet were wild animals and just 1% were humans. Now the situation is a little bit different, right? 4% of all the animals on this planet are actually wild animals. 60% are livestock, so these animals that we keep forcing into existence and then taking their lives and it just keeps going in cycles. 36% are us humans. Very, very different situation now. The fishing industry. You see a lot of people posting on social media about plastic pollution in the oceans, right? Plastic straws, all that stuff. Turns out, around 46% of all the pollution in the oceans comes from the fishing industry. Scientists estimate that 650,000 whales, dolphins, and seals are killed every single year by fishing lines, fishing vessels. So what happens there? Well, they're of course fishing for the fish that they intend on fishing for, and then in the end, the, the fishing lines and all that, the things that they're not gonna use anymore, they just dump it in the ocean, they just leave it there, they don't care. So the animals either mistake it for food and eat it, or they, they get wrapped up in the plastic or whatever in the nets, and they suffocate. 40 to 50 million sharks every single year killed by fishing nets. And not to mention all the additional plastic that all those products, fish products, meat products, dairy products, get wrapped up in, right? It's probably way more. So what about the Amazon alone? What's actually happening there? There's a lot of fires all over the place, right? Well, they're, they're actually setting the forest on fire on purpose. It's been going on for a very long time. It's just that now it's intensifying and the damage is worse than ever. So now we're noticing it more. Now we're talking about it more. There's more fires than ever. Why would they do that? Well, because the soil is very nutrient dense and they want to keep growing soy and other plant-based food. So some people argue, well, then it's soy. We shouldn't eat soy. But most of, those, most of that food, including the soy, is used to feed the animals that we keep creating all the time. And like I said, a pig, a cow, they will eat and drink a lot more than a human. Another example of this, in Africa alone, we grow plant-based food that could potentially feed 10 billion people. That's enough. That's enough. But they grow the animals, they give it to the animals, they feed the animals with this food, then they kill them off, and then they ship it to different continents to feed privileged people. Not sustainable. Not sustainable at all. Just a couple more photos about what's happening in the Amazon and Australia. So houses set on fire, cars destroyed, human lives being uh, taken as well. Kangaroos dying out. Now, I don't know the accuracy of this statement, but I've read somewhere that apparently all the koalas in Australia are now officially extinct. I don't know if that's true or if it's just some species of koalas, not sure. But either way, I am not too thrilled about it. Another hot topic lately, right? It's all over social media, it's all over the media. The coronavirus. People are shutting down borders. Well, latest, uh, latest research actually shows, from what I came to understand, that it also comes from our constant exploitation of the animals. This is a picture of the Huanan Seafood Market. Now, unlike most markets that we, that we are used to, in this particular market, they're actually slaughtering the animals right there in front of the customers. So it's even less biosecure than, than most markets. And I'm not saying that our markets uh, here are more biosecure, a little bit, but they, those animals, they still come from places that are riddled with diseases. Every single time I enter a farm, there's always a separate room where they keep all the antibiotics, all, all the vaccines, all the B12 and other supplements that they give to the animals, and then they make us believe that we get that from meat. Those vitamins, it's because they give supplements to the animals. 
So what can we actually do about this? Some of you may have recognized, uh, some of you may recognize the people on the slide. Starting from the left, Mahatma Gandhi. He was a very uh, successful revolutionary. He successfully led India to independence in the 1920s. Now he used methods of nonviolent direct action, or what we call civil disobedience. So those were basically illegal acts of protesting. But it showed society, and it showed the government and, and companies and so on and so on, that this is how we get their attention, because they're not listening. So he was participating in many different uh, types of, of these protests. He uh, did all sorts of strikes and marches and sit-ins. So what a sit-in would be is you have a bunch of people sit down on the floor peacefully, uh, maybe blocking an entrance or something like that. Just to cause disruption in society, right? To gain attention and so on and so on. So oftentimes those were illegal acts of activism and Gandhi was arrested, just like every single activist on the screen. Rosa Parks, she was one of the most important activists, one of the most significant women in the civil rights movement. Uh, what did she do? In the 1950s and 60s, some of you might know, it was illegal for black people to ride in the front of the bus. And if that bus was full and a white person got on the bus, that person had to give up the seat to the white person. Now, I believe Rosa Parks was the first one to refuse to do that. And she got arrested for it. She got arrested for refusing to surrender her seat to a white person. Absolutely ridiculous. So she became very famous for that. Alice Paul, she was one of the suffragists, one of the significant women in the women's rights movement. She was one of the people who advocated for women's rights to vote because that, of course, wasn't illegal as well. What well, wasn't legal, excuse me. Martin Luther King, one of my favorite activists, absolute inspiration to me. He was actually arrested 29, 29 times over the course of his lifetime. For what? For saying that black people should have the same rights as white people? That's basically exactly what he got arrested for, 29 times. So just like those other people, he used methods of direct action, civil disobedience, things that were illegal back then. Let's remember that slavery used to be illegal. All right? Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. And I love this quote because being involved in the animal rights and climate justice movement for around uh, six years now, and I, I started off with like human rights work, I was involved in the LGBT community and I was doing some anti-capitalist campaigns and so on before that, then I shifted more towards animal rights. But looking at this whole movement now, from what I came to see over the years, I saw that this whole topic, this whole issue has been ignored for a very long time. Right? People ignored it. When we started talking about this, many people were just like, eh, whatever. When we found out about all these things, it's not like everybody all, all of a sudden was out in the street saying, oh yeah, we have to do something about that. No one cared. Then we started doing activism for animal rights, for climate justice, and they started laughing. Six years ago, when people found out I don't eat any animal products, they were laughing at me. They were mocking me. I was bullied. No one cared. Right? Now, traveling the world, meeting so many people, it generally doesn't happen to me that much anymore. Because more and more people are becoming more aware, more compassionate, more aligned with their actual values. So now we recognize the seriousness of this thing. Then they fight you. I believe that comes with direct action. When you get bolder, you show people you're actually willing to risk your freedom because this issue is serious. And then eventually you win, but it's a long journey. There's actually, a, uh, there's actually this rule, it's called the rule of the 3.5%, and it says that every single social justice movement in the history, like the Indian independence movement, civil rights movement, and many others, ended up being successful once they gained the support of 3.5% of the population. Every single one. It's a small number, but that's all it takes. Rosa Parks said, I would like to be remembered as a person who wanted to be free so that other people could also be free. Now call me insane, but I also believe that the animals deserve to be free from our exploitation. And I believe that our planet deserves to be free from our exploitation. I always feel the movement is a sort of a mosaic. Each one of us puts in a little piece and then we end up having a mosaic in the end. Alice Paul. I love this quote so much. 
Because being involved in the animal rights and climate justice movement for, for, for quite a few years now, I can tell you how many people I've heard say, I'm just one person, what can I change? I'm just one person, I don't matter, I'm too small, I can't change anything. Imagine if every single person said that, we would never get anywhere. To ignore evil is to become accomplice to it, Martin Luther King. And I truly believe that if we keep ignoring what's happening to the animals, if we keep ignoring this climate crisis, we become accomplice to it by being silent. Some of you may know Greta Thunberg, an amazing activist from Sweden. She started doing her thing when she was just 15 years old. She started sitting in front of the building of the parliament in Stockholm, Sweden, by herself with a banner that said, school strike for the climate. She refused to keep going to school because she said, what's the point? There's no time. If there's no future, what's the point of education? And I don't want to discourage you from coming to this school, all right? It's not what I'm about. But she has a very good point. She said, what's the point of caring about a career and a future if there is no future? She doesn't consume any animal products whatsoever. She talks about it openly in interviews for environmental and ethical reasons. And I talk about her because she is so young. And the picture on the right is a picture a year later where she sparked a whole revolution of millions of people joining the movement all around the world. One 15-year-old person did that. One person. Very powerful. And I'm not much older than, than you. I, I left high school a couple of years ago. So I recognize the importance of this, no matter the age. So what exactly do I mean by saying that animal rights are now important more than ever? Well, the animal's basic right to live a life free from suffering and harm has always been just as important as it is today. The only thing that's a little bit different today is that now we actually recognize that our constant exploitation of innocent animal lives is also leading us to an early grave. So now we care. Now it's personal. Now it's affecting us directly, right? So for those reasons, today I want to invite all of you to say no to all animal products. But don't stop there. Now I know it's a lot to take in. It's hard to imagine because I'm already asking so much of you. But don't stop there. I want you to get active. I want you to get active and start doing something, anything. Whatever it is that you can do as an individual to raise awareness about this issue, do it. Do it and talk about it with other people. Talk about it with your friends, talk about it with your families, talk about it with your teachers, talk about it with everyone, share it on social media. I know it's hard and I know it's challenging, but we don't have the time anymore to keep arguing or discussing whether soy milk tastes better than a cow's breast milk. Not while this injustice is happening behind the walls of slaughterhouses and factory farms. So we need to take action and we need to take it now and we need to unite. Despite our differences, despite our political disagreements, the color of our skin or our gender, no matter where we come from or how much experience we actually have with activism. Because we are all alone in this. And what I mean by that is we cannot keep waiting for the ones who are in power to do something about this issue. We need to pressure those who, those who are in power to do something about this issue. They're not going to do it on their own. They don't care about you or the animals or me or the environment as long as they have enough money for the rest of their lives, maybe for their kids. And I believe we can also do something for the individuals who are locked inside of cages at this very moment. Because I believe it is us who are the keys to those cages with our actions and our decisions. And it is us who are the future generation. Therefore, I believe it is our responsibility to speak out against this injustice. And I hope, I really hope that it will also be us who will make a difference in the end. Thank you.